we're going to get into the Word of God. We've been in a series entitled Peace Under Pressure. We are in our third week of Peace Under Pressure. And uh, so what I'm going to talk about today, uh, let me open it by saying this. I've got good news for you. I have found a way to make it so much easier to carry your Bible. I have found a way to make it so much lighter. All you got to do is rip out all the verses that have to do with money, generosity, and, and, and possessions and that kind of thing. And your Bible is so much lighter. Isn't that awesome? You just rip them out. And, and that thing is, it goes like, gets really thin. But I got even better news. We can leave them in and apply the stuff and even be that much more excited. Now, there's an old saying, when a, when a preacher talks about money, there's no faster way to clear out a church. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, I got good news. We're, we're, and this is not going to be one of those, oh, great, he's, uh, he's looking for this or that from me. No, this is simply, keep in mind what our, our message is. It's peace under pressure. And, and if we're going to be honest, I mean, like it or not, money has a lot to do with life. You know, you just, I mean, if you look at what it took to get you here this morning, well, there was a lot of money involved because you, you had to pay money for the bed, most likely, that you sleep in. And then you probably got up and, and ate, ate breakfast. Well, that probably cost you money to buy those groceries. Then you had to put clothes on your back, and that probably cost you money to buy those clothes. And you had to get in a car to get here. Well, you probably had to buy that car. You probably had to buy gas to put in that car to get in here. And that's before service even started. Look how much money's involved, right? So can, can we like be honest and just, uh, we're, we're very real here. We're very honest. We're very open. Sometimes we stress over money. You know, you know I, I like to be the first one to confess things. I think lately I've been confessing something every week. I don't know. I'm just clearing my soul with y'all every week. I don't know what it is. But uh, I, I'll be honest. I wish I didn't think about money as much as I do sometimes. It's like sometimes it's just, you know, it's just stressful sometimes. It's like, okay, I've got this much. I've got these needs. And, you know, it's, it's wrong to steal, so that's out. And, uh, you know, so some it's just, but, um, but my goal in this message simply is this, is, is no matter where you may find yourself financially today, is that you would be on a real peace journey in your financial situation. Peace under the pressure that finances can bring. And, and so take a deep breath, it's gonna be okay. And, and, and we're gonna learn some things today about how do I apply some, some biblical truth to bring more peace in my financial life. The, the title for my message uh, is, is More Money Blues. The More Money Blues, who's got a harmonica? We're gonna do the More Money Blues because Sometimes we think that's the answer to more peace. If I just have more money, man, I mean, who, who can't relate to that on some level? If I did a little bit more money, in comes the peace. Well, let's, let's get into the Word of God today, and we will, we will kind of see. So, so keep in mind, the goal of where I'm going today is, is to flood you with peace, even in your finances, no matter where you're at. I want to begin by uh, asking ourselves a question that God asked Adam. When Adam sinned and hid himself from God, God asked him this simple question, where are you? So let's open with this question when it comes to our finances, just to yourself. Now ask yourself, where am I? Where am I in my relationship with finances, with money? Where, where am I at? Where am I? And because and see, a lot of times when you're in a stressful situation, when you feel overwhelmed, isn't it easier sometimes to say, you know what, I'm, I'm just not going to look at it. I don't want to know. I'm just going to bury my head in the sand because it's too stressful to like even look at it. So I'd rather just not know. But like God said to Adam, where are you? Everything it gets way better when you just take a, take a realistic look and say, where am I? My wife and I, no matter how stressful finances have been over the years, we always do better when we sit down and say, okay, honey, let's figure out where we at. Where are we at? You know, and and that's, that's a beautiful place to begin. Where am I? Let me read a verse to you that is kind of like finances 101 and getting peace. And it's in Luke 14, and it's verse 28. And it simply reads this. For which of you, desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Right there, we'll stop right there. Pretty straightforward, right? Just, just get, to get a good feel on where am I at. You know, sometimes we just want to go, we want to buy, we want to do, but we don't always know where we're even at. And so just like Jesus says here, before you go and build, before you go and buy, before you go and do this or that, count the cost. And so peace 101, right off the bat, two questions, where am I? 
And, and what is it going to take, whatever it is you're talking about in life, whatever the thing is that you're, you're praying about. Um, think about it. Even Jesus, when he multiplied and did the miracle with the fish and the bread, right? There was 10 loaves and five fish. So Jesus kind of said, well, we, we got all these people to feed. We got to feed the 5,000. And keep in mind, that was just the men. There was probably 20,000 people at that particular sitting. So Jesus kind of had to know, where, where are we at here? Where are we starting? Okay, so we got five fish and 10 loaves. All right, that's where we're at. Now we know what we got to do. You see, you just kind of got to know where you're at. You got to know where you're starting. Maybe that sounds like some of your situations in life. Like, man, I got, my, my bills are like 5,000 people and my reality is like five fish and 10 loaves, you know? But there's something about just knowing where you're at. Right off the bat, that immediately begins to enter peace in when you just have a reality check. Where am I at? Now, if you're like a lot of us uh, who are trying to improve your financial situation, we all, no matter who you are, where you're from, what your background is, that there's two simple solutions to getting more peace in your finances. I think we could all agree this is a very practical thing I'm about to say. And that's simply this. Find a way to spend less and make more. All right? Is that, is that not kind of money 101? You know, I mean, that, that's kind of like how we begin to de-stress oftentimes. All right, what am I spending money on that I don't need to? Where can I cut some, some expenditures, some debt? And where can I bring some more in? But I, I say all that to say more importantly than that, my, my next point in getting peace in your finances is start to celebrate the little victories. Take a cue from God. Take a cue from God in Genesis chapter 1. Like right off the bat, you can, you can take a cue from God right in Genesis chapter 1. On the first day when, when God created, it says this. It says, on the first day, he created light. And you know what it says right after that? God said it was good. You notice God didn't say this. I created light, but I can't, I can't even get excited about that because I got so much more to create. He didn't wait till he created everything and then step back and say it is good. He said, let there be light. We're only on day one and he's already saying it is good. You want to start to bring peace and start to celebrate, you know, hey, we paid off a credit card. It is good. Hey, we found a way to save 30 bucks a month. It is good. And start to get excited about the little victories. You, you know, chop one thing off at a time, whatever that looks like in your life. Hey, we found a way to go out to eat less. Look what we're saving. That, that, it is boring. Who said boring? Oh, you did. No wonder. I should have known who the heckler in the room. Well, this is very real to us because when we start cutting out, eating out on Sundays... I know. I miss it, too. Maybe we'll just do it and go back in debt. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it's amazing how much money we save because all the kids we have want to eat, too. <laughs> I, I, which I was blown. I thought they'd get so much joy out of seeing mom and dad eat, and they just, you just wait till you get home, color. I don't care if you're 18, <laughs> 17, getting a dirty look. Anyway, um, it's all good. But you know, they're, they're little victories, and little victories get you excited. Pay the small credit card off first, because it's, it's low-hanging fruit, you know, and you can get yourself excited, and, and because victory produces more victory. And so God, just like day one, let there be light, and it is good. Be quick to say it is good every time you get a financial victory, man. Start to celebrate it. Now, let's switch gears a little bit, because um, I want to know what Jesus thinks. Those are a couple practical thoughts that I think, you know, and, and, and backing them up with Scripture. But, but what does God think? What would Jesus say if Jesus was in the room? I like to play this game a lot. Jesus, what do you want to tell us about finances? We need them to live, and, and, and we, need, we need our possessions. We need our things. What, what do we need? What do you want us to know, Jesus? And you know, something about Jesus is uh, he shared a lot in parables, did he not? Jesus liked parables, and if you don't know what a parable is, let me explain. A parable is a little story that Jesus would tell to, dry to, to try to drive home a point that he was already making, right? So that's what a lot of preachers do, right? We try to come up with stories that drive home the truth. Well, Jesus did that a lot. And do you know that half his parables had to do with, with either money or possessions or generosity? Why does he talk about it so much? Why does God bring up money so much? Could it be? Because it's just such a big part of our life that, that God went after it so much. 
And yet, it's so often something we don't want to talk about, but it's such a, a big part. So I want, to, I want him to weigh in. So one of the things Jesus tells us, actually, let's turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. All right, here he is, right? I picture Jesus sitting right here. Jesus, what, and there's a million things we could look at today on finances, but we're not. You're going to be out of here by 10 after, because I got another crew coming in. So... So we're not going to hit a million verses, don't worry. Okay, Jesus, you got the mic. What do you want us to know? Matthew 6, verse 19 says this, reads this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now, did you hear what I just heard? Do you know, you and I, every one of us, no matter what your age, have a bank account in heaven? So if you like, I don't know where you bank at. I bank at Independent Bank, you see, and I have this app on my phone, and every day I can check my account, and I can see what's in my checking, what's in my savings, and after I wipe my tears away, uh, <laughs> after I get done praying for a half hour after that, no. Do you know there's a third column if you look at your app, and it's heavenly account. Independent bank's the only bank that does it, I think. <laughs> now, unfortunately, they don't do that for us. I don't know. I got to talk to Renee. But uh, having said that, you know, you, you really don't see it till you stand before the Lord. But the Lord is saying, listen, you store up stuff here. It gets old. It gets destroyed. And so confession number two of the day, uh, sometimes I like stuff. I don't know. What is it about stuff? Stuff's kind of fun. I'm, I'm going to tell you a little, something, a little secret I've learned, okay? This, this works for me. It may not work for anybody else. Uh, but uh, when I find myself really wanting more stuff, uh, I have this little thing that I do. And let's just make it really real. Back, back in December, I, 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 conf I told you a couple weeks ago at Father's Day that I've been into shooting guns and, and just enjoying a new hobby in my life, pistols and rifles and that. Well, I only have one of each. But, but I remember I, I, had the, I had this rifle, and I said, all I need to do to complete and, and be happy is, is just get my handgun to go with my rifle. So in December, here's what I do. When I get excited about buying something, this is just be, me being very real with you, uh, I like to research it. So like a month before I bought this, this gun, I researched it, and I didn't look at the YouTube clips, and I wanted to see the reviews, and uh, you know, I just got excited, and you know, here it is, it's Christmas time. Sometimes you feel more generous with yourself at uh, Christmas time, and uh, see, so get gifts for the kids or get a gun. It was easy, but uh, now the kids actually got gifts too, but uh, you know, so, so I, I ended up getting the uh, Smith & Wesson M&P Shield 2.0 with the Crimson Trace laser kind of man you think, I am. I'm not going to get the laser. Um, so, um, but here's what happened. I am going somewhere with this, uh, not just for my gun friends in the room. So I got the thing, and it just looks so cool in my hand, and you know, it's just like, I got it. I can stop doing all the reviews and all that. And, and I remember saying to myself, I'm set. I got one rifle. I got one handgun. I'm good. I am good. And then there she was. Her name was Sig Sauer P320 RX. I get more amens from guns than Jesus. I don't know what's going on in here. That was a little embarrassing because my wife and I went to Ben's and we were, I said, you go look for what you're going to look for. I'm just going to browse around myself. And she came walking up and found me holding it, taking a picture of it in my hand. I was caught. I'm a little weird. I don't know. Well, here's the thing. I, I am nowhere in a place to get that thing. But you know what I do when I find myself wanting stuff? Wanting to get stuff that I don't really need, but that I want. I'm not saying it's a sin to go out and buy yourself something nice. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes it's just not the time, you know? And, and so I, I find myself doing this little trick. That Smith & Wesson M&P Shield, I've had it now six months. It's not the new thing anymore. Oh. But what I do... As I remember to myself, there was a time six months ago where that thing was the thing. If I just had that, so I go back every now and then if I find myself getting discontent, 
Because see, the Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. And where does contentment come from? It comes from being happy with what you already have. So I find myself going on YouTube and looking at the old clips that I used to look at that got me excited about that thing in the first place. And I say, I, like, I find myself going right back there like, yeah, this is a cool thing. Hey, wait a minute. I own this. I'm good, you know? And, and it's really like this little trick that works for me is when I'm having a contentment issue and I just need to say, come on, Paul, what's going on? You, you got what you need. You think buying that thing is going to answer your contentment questions? You will get that thing. You will look at it. You will have it on your dresser. Don't worry, I don't put it on the dresser openly, but where I put it, you know. And then you will say a week later, there she is. And it could be the Mossberg JM Pro 22. Where does it end? You see, so godliness with contentment. Stuff is not satisfying. As a matter of fact, it all gets old. It all gets ruined. It all rust and moth destroy. But we have a bank account in heaven, the Lord says. I, I don't know. I, I picture this. I don't know if you guys picture this, but man, I don't know when my last breath is going to be. And this is real stuff. And I'm going to stand before the Lord one day. And so are you, you know? And I don't want to be embarrassed on that day. I don't really, what I have in my bank account here will never matter to com compared to what my bank account is there. Yeah, I got to live. Yeah, I got to feed my family. And, you know, I got to get through life. But, man, I don't want to be stingy there. Can you imagine? I had all this here, but nothing there? And that's eternity, man. You know, it's like you, you don't get a chance to come back, you know, and do it again. And so if God didn't care a lot about generosity, man, he wouldn't talk about it so, so much. Speaking of that, while you're in Matthew, let's turn to Matthew 25, because I want Jesus to talk to us a little more about this. Like I said, there's a million verses we could look at, not literally, but there's quite a few. But I want Jesus to weigh in a few things. So in Matthew 25, we're going to let him talk to us starting in verse 14. Matthew 25, 14. So now before I, I read this, uh, we're about to read a parable. If you go back further in Matthew 25, you will see what this parable is about. Jesus says, this parable you're about to hear is what it will be like in the kingdom one day. This is what it's going to be like. Are you ready? That, that's, that's, the, that's the backdrop. So starting in verse 14, it reads, for it will be like a man going on a journey. Now the man in this parable is God who called his servants, his, the servants are us. I won't keep stopping every two words, don't worry. But I had to set the stage. He's the man going on the journey, we're the servants. And it says, he called his servants and entrusted them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his ability. And then he went away. Now pause right there for a second. I want you to have an understanding of what the word talent means here. See, for the longest time, I believed talents meant your abilities as in, what talents do you have? Can you fix things? Can you cook? Can you speak? Can you do this? You know, I believe there is truth to that too, that, that we are to be accountable for those talents. But in this parable and in this section of scripture, a talent is money. He's literally talking about money. As a matter of fact, one talent was equal to 70 pounds of gold. That's how much money he was giving these boys. So I want you to understand the, the, the whole paradigm shift of this is this is a money parable. Money is important to the Lord. So anyway, how do you think he's going to pave the gold streets? It's you guys. No, anyway, nobody laughed at that. Let's move on. So starting in verse, there it is. Thank you. Pay you for that. Verse 15, to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his abilities. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more, but he who had received the one talent made and dug in the ground, went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he, had, he, had, he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. He calls that a little. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the, the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents here. I have made two talents more. 
His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give to him who has the 10 talents for to everyone who has will be given more and he who will have an abundance but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taking, taken away. Now, I want to break a few things down in this. My friends, if we get this truth, this can really change and give us a whole new paradigm shift with stuff and money and bring peace in. Let's break down a few thoughts. Number one, we have to define what the word stewardship means. This might sound stressful what I'm about to say to you, but listen, if you grasp this truth, it will set you free. It will help you in your finances. Guess what? God is the owner of everything. See, that was, that's the beginning of this parable. He entrusted to them his stuff. It was all his. See, here's what happens in life, I believe. We forget that it's his. We start to think it's ours. Let's pretend I'm rich for a second. It's going to take you a while to get your, your, your imagination there. Let me know when you got it. You got it locked in? Okay. So let's pretend I'm rich and I own this really, really nice yacht, a $100,000 yacht. And I say to you, I want you to borrow my yacht. Go ahead. Take it. Go on a cruise, enjoy it, take that thing. I'll come back in six months and get it from you. And then I call you in six months and say, you know what, I'm busy. Take it for another six months. And then I call you in another six months and say, you know what, I'm going to be a while. Have it for another year. Guess what happens? If a year goes by, two years goes by, before long, you forget that it's not yours. And you start to think it's yours. And all of a sudden, I come back after four years, hey, I'm ready to get my yacht back. You'd be like, well, what yacht? I own that thing now. See, it's a subtle thing. We think we're the owner. But, but freedom with peace with your money is just to take a deep breath and realize, I don't own it. I just manage it. I've been entrusted to manage it, but I don't own it. The more you own stuff, the more you got to stress over it. But when you realize it's God's and your job is just to be a good steward over his stuff and his money, that's where peace begins. The next thing I want you to see in this parable is he doesn't give everybody the same amount. And he only expects you to be accountable for the amount he gave you. He gave one guy five talents, another one two, another one one. And he only expects you to be faithful with that, you know, and and, and what he gives you. So God chooses. Now, before you get worked and say, whoa, whoa, I'm giving the third whoa, whoa. I made that money. I worked hard for that. That is not God's money. I worked for that. Do you see my overtime I put in? You know how much schooling I had to do to get to that point? Let me tell you something. Who gave you the ability to do it? Who gave you the skills that you have? Who gave you the ability to get in that car every day and go? Who gave you the favor with the boss? Who gave you the work ethic that you have? Everything you have to be able to make that money came from God. It is his. And let me just tell you, man, God's generous. God is good. He's not a stingy God, but he wants us to know that it's his. Now, what is he talking about in this parable when he says, the third guy? Let's zero in on that dude. He went and buried the money because he, he says, you know, I, I, you, you reap where you do not sow. Let's kind of put that in modern terminology. Why should I give to the things of God? There, it's not his, it's mine. You know, why, why should I give to kingdom things? But what's God's response to that? See, I tell you this for one reason, man. Please know my motive, and I can say this purely before God. God is my witness, okay? You know, as they say, I'm not saying any of this to you because I want to trick you into giving money, more money to me or the church. I mean, if that's my motive, Lord, get me out of here quick. I, have, I fear God way too much to have that be my motive. If there's something in it for me, I've seen mishandled finances in the hands of preachers. I don't ever want to be that guy. I fear God, man. I don't ever want to be the guy who's got a nice, fancy uh, 
line to try to get you to give more. If you think that's what it is, please, before God, it's not. What I want is men and women that I have the ability to preach to, to get free in this area and to have peace. And when you get generous before God, he loves to play this game, and I wish I played better. You can't outgive God. That's the game. All right, I'm going to come visit your church soon. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to do that to you. Uh, she always spies on me when I'm preparing my messages. She needs to be arrested. Um, yes, you can't outgive God. That is the game. You, you can't. You can't. And, and, and sometimes when I, when I get all scared, because God put in my heart to give a certain amount to something kingdom-related, and I finally do it after I get off the fear and trembling. I mean, my wife is my witness. In 22 years of marriage, we've done some crazy, ridiculous giving and things. I'm only telling you that because I'm your preacher and I'm an open book. You should know the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, and I tell you a lot of the bad, so once in a while I'll tell you the good. And, and we've never seen, we've never regretted giving. Ever, ever, ever have I regretted giving. I've regretted stupid purchases. I regretted the intrepid, Chrysler Intrepid I bought back in 98. I didn't need that. I just wanted it. It was a stupid purchase. It lost value right off the lot. I mean, there's other things I could tell you I wish I wouldn't have bought, but I've never regretted giving to the kingdom, whether it's to church stuff, mission stuff, a poor person. <laughs> you know, when you give to the poor, you know what the Bible says? You give to Jesus. When you give to the poor, you give to Jesus. And so I've just never regretted being generous. I want to be more generous, to be honest with you. I, I feel like I haven't even got close to as generous as I want to be. But I, I, I've, I always lose at that game, trying to outgive God. You can't. You can't. Uh, one of the marks of maturity in Christ, I'm just going to tell you, because Jesus says it himself, is giving. Is when you get free in that area. Um, now let me say this too. Sometimes the idea, you know, there, there's two ways people talk about money from the pulpit often. If you watch some of, the, some of the preachers on TV, and they're not all doing this, but a lot of preachers on TV will tell you, God wants you to be a millionaire. That's what it means to be blessed. He wants everybody rich. All you got to do is send in this and buy this cloth, you know, or whatever, and watch your finances multiply. There's a lot of scam out there, and I fear God for those people when they stand before the Lord one day. But then there's this other extreme that, you know, money is this wicked thing. And oh, I don't want to touch it. I don't even want to look at it. It's wicked. It's money. And I'm a Christian and I can't want money. And I, you know, my, let me tell you something. Money in the hands of godly, generous people who have their heart right with God is awesome. It is. The love of money is the root of all evil. That's what the Bible says. But money in itself, man, it's a huge tool to be used to bless people. Why wouldn't we want it for that purpose? I mean, it, it, right? I mean, why do you think Jesus talks about it so much? If we're going to ignore money, let's just go out and get thin Bibles. Let's rip all those pages out. Because Jesus knows, man, if I got your wallet, I got your heart. You know, if I got that, I've got you because, well, we put a lot of hope in our money. We like to see it grow. There's a comfort in it. I like to see, hey, there's some money in my account. Woo, it feels good. But boy, you can take that out of balance really quick. I want to spend my last few moments talking to you on the blessing side of money. Getting on the blessing side of money. Do you know there are some 8,000 promises in the Bible? Those promises fall into two categories. Category number one, promises that Jesus makes that has nothing to do with you. Kind of like, I promise I'm coming back again. That has nothing to do with you. No matter what you do, you can't change that promise. But there are, the other half of the promises are things that are directly in relation to what you do. You do this, and I'll do that, is what the Bible says. What kind of preacher would I be if I'm just going to ignore those and not tell you some of that great news? Let me just hit a few really quick. Really quick. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. Now, the whole crux behind that is the word first fruits. Give the first fruits. I don't sit there and harp on tithing a lot in this church. I probably preach on it less than any preacher I've ever known. But, man, I, I would never want to live and not tithe. I don't care if I'm going through a season of a lot or a season of a little. To give my first fruits to God 
is such a principle that I can't live without. And I tell you what, I hear testimonies from people in this church and other churches all the time. How I was afraid to tithe, I was afraid to give my 10%, I was afraid to do that, and I finally start doing it, and I don't know how it happened, but God has provided for me. I make no apology in saying that because I want you free. I want you free, and God, you can test him in that. You can test him in that, and just get free in that area, my friends. Get free in that area. You will never regret it. Luke 6, 38 simply reads this, give and it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing. Do we give so we can get? No. That's not the motive of giving. We give because he first gave to us and is so good to us, but we can't help but give out of a generous, thankful heart, man. That's what we do. We give, you know. I don't sit there and track down what everybody's given, by the way. So that's the beauty of being able to preach this. I preach it with a clear conscience. I don't sit there and say, I know this one's given that, and I know this one's given that. I don't really care. It's between you and God. My, my, my team can tell you that. Um, it says in Proverbs 11.25, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. What, it, what it's not saying is if you start tithing, you're suddenly going to be rich. No. But you will prosper in ways you didn't see coming. Prosperity in God's eyes is not prosperity like you hear some of the preachers preaching it. You're all going to go out and get a jet airplane. We all got to have our jet airplanes, you know, because that's what God wants. No. Prosperity can be in many things. And the first thing that God wants to prosper is your soul, that your soul would prosper. But my friends, it's a beautiful thing. A generous person. Generosity, by the way, for some of you could be one dollar, you know, do you remember how excited Jesus got when the little old lady gave her two, two bits, two mites? Do you know how much that's worth? That's like a penny. And he sat there, and I'm going to put it in Paul Rowling terms. He kind of hit the guys next to him, you know, because he made a point. Study it yourself. It's in the Gospels. He, he, he called his disciples over. Hey, hey, did you see this? These guys all gave out of their abundance. She gave out of all she had. So God don't care about the number. God cares about what, what's, what's generous for you is not going to be generous for me. And what's generous for somebody else might be nothing for somebody else. But God doesn't care about the amount. He looks at the heart, you know. He looks at the heart. And he says a generous person will prosper. I want to close with one last verse on this. Let's turn there as we wrap this up. Actually, yeah, go ahead and turn there. It's Philippians chapter 4. I want to read verses 15 through 17. Because what Paul is saying here is, is the crux of what I believe I'm trying to say to you as well. If you, really, if you catch what Paul is saying. Philippians 4, verse 15. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving. Okay, so at first glance, it kind of seems like Paul's griping. You're like, nobody's giving to me. What's going on? Nobody's given to my ministry. But listen to his heart. He says, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in, Mes even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once again. But now he gives the motive for why he's saying this. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. That's what I want you to hear. As we wrap up this message, listen to that last part. I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. He's saying, what I really want is I want to see you all bear much fruit because the fruit that you bear is, is by giving. Now, listen, I, I just want to say this, too, about this church. Please know I am so grateful for the generous heart of this church. I mean, I'm not bashing anybody. I'm not up here ranting. I don't like angry preachers, to be honest with you. I don't like that style of preaching. You all should be ashamed of yours. You know, I'm not into that. I don't feel like Jesus was like that. The Jesus I think of, man, he actually smiled. And he told crazy jokes, maybe. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> you are a generous church, and you are great. And, and, and your generosity is not just in giving money. A lot of you serve in a lot of ways that if it wasn't for you, we'd have no church. So I cannot thank you enough. Please hear the angle of where I'm coming from. For those of you who give radically, this is to let you know you're on the right track. But maybe there's some here who've never taken that step, man. I get it. I've been there. I remember that first tithe check. I didn't want to let it go. You know, I was like, can I get that back out of the basket? <laughs> you know what I mean? 
But I'm telling you, like Paul says, it's, it's, I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. And, and here's the thing. You know, the Bible says that preachers and pastors are subject to double judgment. I don't want to stand before the Lord and him say, bro, I don't know if he'd say bro, Paul, I wrote so much in my word about giving and generosity, and you never talked about it? What, were you afraid of the people? I, mean, I want to be that guy, you know? So I want to tell you what it says. And just ask yourself, you know, why haven't I? Am I what am I afraid of? You know, what am I, what, why am I afraid to give? Well, I, we know the answer. We see the bills. We see what's in the account. But you want to get real free? Learn to play that game with him. Play that game with him. Don't be stupid with it. Don't be like, man, I got to give all I had because that's what he said. Now I can't. No, man, but even baby steps. Baby steps, it's a beautiful thing. Um, I've just never seen, I've never seen somebody give to the Lord and, and, and him not take care of them. I've just never seen it. Never. In all the years I've served the Lord, I've never heard that testimony. I gave, and I'm not talking you tested it for a week. All right, here goes, like playing the lottery. Oh, man, I didn't win. You know, it's not, I'm not talking that. I'm talking it becomes your lifestyle. Um, but in closing, let me, just, let me just recap the peace journey. Number one, where am I? Where am I at? Number two, I'm going to celebrate the progress. Every time I pay off a credit card or make an adjustment, I'm going to celebrate because every step is a step closer. Number three, I'm going to realize who the owner is. It's not mine anyway. It's all God's. And lastly, man, I want to get on the blessing side of giving. I'm going to get on the blessing side of money because he talks about it a lot. Or lighten your Bible. Just rip them out. It'll be easier on your back. Maybe it depends how heavy your Bible is. And I want to leave you with that. So I love you guys very much. Let me pray a blessing over you. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you that you've shown us how to handle this thing called money, Lord. And last time I checked, most of us probably need it in some way to live. But, oh, God, it's, it can be easy to, to depend on it so heavily. It can be easy to get greedy with it and say, it's all mine on, on how I want to spend it, and I'm not going to give anything to your purposes. Help us, Lord, to get free. Help us to realize it's not ours. It's yours. And you're a generous God. You're not a stingy God. And so, Lord, we trust you. And I just pray, Lord God, that peace would begin to, to come over us that don't have peace with our finances, that we say, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do something exciting. I'm going to start getting in line with, with what you tell me about finances. And Lord, I just uh, I thank you for, uh, for, for all of us who are going to step into that and take it to the next place. Lord, help us, guide us, speak to us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you very much. Have an awesome day.